Good afternoon again. Thank you for being here. My name is Jorge Duani. I'm the director of the Cuban Research Institute here at FIU, uh, which organized today's uh, lecture. I also want to acknowledge the co-sponsorship of today's event by FIU's Jose Martí Scholarship Fund, led by a good friend and colleague, Dr. Raúl Moncarza. And I want to recognize the presence of the, the group from Belén Jesuit Prep School in the back. Uh, and thank you. Thank you also Father Frank Permui and uh, Father Willy Garcia Tuñón for supporting their visit. It's a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Uh, Uwele Aragón, who is a former associate director of the Cuban Research Institute here at FIU, where she also taught courses on Cuba. Although she retired officially in 2011, I think she's busier than ever. She <laughs> continues to write, publish, travel, and lecture widely. And even last year, she produced a theatrical version of her novel, The Memory of Silence, in Venezuela, Chile, and also here in Miami. Born in Havana, uh, Dr. Aragón de Aragón has published a dozen books of essays, poetry, short stories, and all of them play. Her works have appeared in uh, many textbooks, anthologies, and literary magazines, published in Spain, the United States, and Cuba. Uh, her novel, Memoria de Silencio, was first published in 2002 and was translated into English last year, or actually two years before. Um, into English as a memory of silence, and we had the pleasure of introducing uh, uh, the, uh, the translated version here, and also have a panel with the translator. Uh, her latest book is titled El Mundo y Mi Cuba en el Diario, which is published in Holguín, Cuba, in 2016, and the second edition will be published here in Miami later this year. She's also writing a novel, but I don't think she wants to talk about that for the moment <laughs> until it's published. Uh, and also, uh, she is a, a, a weekly columnist for the Novo Herald and publishes the blog, the blog Habanera Soy, before she was also a regular uh, columnist for Diario de Américas. She previously served as Associate Editor of Cuban Studies, which is the foremost academic journal on Cuba and diaspora, which was also edited here at FIU. And, um, uh, finally, she earned her PhD and MA in Latin American and Spanish literature from the University of Miami. So, without further ado, help me welcome Dr. Ubalara. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you, Jorge. It feels like I must be very old if I've done all those things. <laughs> um, I'm very happy uh, to be here today. I thank Dr. Moncatz for his long standing enthusiasm in. Uh, making the work and uh, life of Jose Martí better understood and uh, known. Uh, I thank Jorge and his staff for inviting me. Um, CRI is my home, I've worked there many years, so I'm very happy uh, for this invitation. And I am also especially happy for the presence of the Belén Jesuit Preparatory School students. Belén is very close to my heart for many reasons, among them that my, two of my grandsons graduated from there, and my youngest one, whose class of 2015, is here today. Um, it's a little dangerous when they, when you give a title and a summary of what you're going to do before you start working on it. And so I haven't changed the title, but I'm not going to do exactly what I said I was going to do. Um, because I said I was going to talk briefly about Marquis' life and then focus on his death. But then when I started um, you know, trying to summarize his life, there was no way I could do that. And um, as I was writing my paper, I consulted my advisor, uh, my youngest grandson, Nicholas, and I tell him, what would you prefer, if I stand in the podium and read a paper for about 35 minutes, or if I do a PowerPoint presentation and start talking? He said, so no brainer, no way. Mm -hmm. so, I prepared a PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to talk briefly in some of them. Some are going to be very brief. Some are going to take a little longer. And then we will open for questions. Um, most of this picture I took from a book that I love very much, which is called Ambito de José Martí by, by Guillermo de Sente, which have many pictures of the places where Martí lived, worked, traveled. So more than pictures of Marti, or you will see some, you will see pictures of places where he went. Um, okay. What's happening here? Nothing. Help, help. <laughs> Music. Yeah. 
Muy bueno, muy bueno. This is the house where he was born, a modest two-story house in Old Havana. What, how it looked then and how it looks now. That, that picture of how it looks now I took uh, myself. Um, these are his parents. Um, his mother was from Canary Islands. His father was from Valencia. A lot has been written about how his father uh, opposed his uh, fight for Cuban independence. But in preparing this, I realized his father had arrived from, from Valencia just five years before Martí was born. Um, so you have to understand, and some of you who are immigrants or of Cuban descent, that 15 years after we came from Cuba, our parents came from Cuba, we felt Cuban, and we still do 50 years later, so you have to understand that his parents felt, you know, like a Spaniard. Um, this is the, the church where he was baptized, as it looked then, as it looks now, Iglesia del Santo Ángel, which features prominently also in the famous um, novel by Cirilo Villaverde, Cecilia Valdez. Um, when he was about nine, his, his father took him with him to the Cuban countryside to help him with his work. Martí had very good handwriting and spelling and would help him do the reports he had to do. And two very important things happened to Martí on that trip. Um, he fell in love with the Cuban countryside, and for the same time, first time he so close to the inhumane treatment um, to slaves. If you haven't seen the movie El Ojo del Canario by um, Perez, um, Fernando Perez, uh, it's, it's focused on, on his youth, uh, and it's, it's a wonderful movie, I recommend it. Um, we have to remember that Martí grew up with the background of the war of the 10 years. He was um, 15 when it started, of course he was too young to fight, but it, um, it was, there was a lot of, of unrest, even though the war was mainly in Oriente. Um, you, he heard the news and he, he was, of course, inspired by the people who were fighting for Cuban independence. Um, this is one of the pictures um, earliest picture of Martí as a student, and a picture of his teacher and mentor and inspirator uh, who inspired him, Rafael María Mendive. Rafael María Mendive was a poet in his own right. He had traveled to the United States, he had traveled to Europe, he had corresponded with Longfellow, with Lamartine, and he was very much for the Cuba independence. Um, he was arrested and deported the school where Martí um, was uh, his school, Martí, was uh, study was closed, and um, Martí would take refuge at his friend's home, Fermín Valdez uh, Domingue. Um, they would take French classes there, and they started publishing a newspaper, Patria Libre, where he wrote, where he wrote a long poem of freedom, Abdala, and um, they learned that one of Medivh's students and their schoolmate had joined the Spanish army, and they wrote a letter to him accusing him of being a traitor. They didn't send the letter, but months later, uh, Fermín's house was searched by the Spanish army, and they found the letter. It was signed by both of them, or not the <coughs> responsibility, and he was arrested and imprisoned. He was uh, sentenced to six years of hard labor, which really took a, a, a toll on his health. And But <coughs> something else happened. Um, his father, uh, for the first time, saw the injustice of the Spanish government, and he really changed the way he, he, he looked at his son and understood his son fight. And he and his mother did everything possible. The mother and the sisters would go see the military, <coughs> the Capitan General, the father would try to imprint until they finally had the sentence commuted, and he went to rest for a few uh, months at uh, either point, and then he was deported to Spain in 1871. And as I was, um, you know, putting this picture up of the trip where he left, it occurred to me that Martin was 18 years old, and in a way he was a Pedro Pan, because he was uh, helped by his parents to flee Cuba, uh, not to, to have further danger, and he, he left all by himself. Um, in Spain, he continued his activism. He published a 
pamphlet about the political pris prisoners. And when the First Republic in 1873, which was more liberal than the monarchy, though it didn't last very long, he tried to influence Spain's poli uh, policies on Cuba. Um, a few months later, or a year later, his friend uh, Fermin arrived in Spain and he found Martí ill and very poor and uh, Fermín had a better economic situation and um, he took him with him to Zaragoza and there they both studied and uh, this was an important time for Martí because he started looking at Spain in a different matter, manner. He, he not only looked at the colonial regime but he learned a lot about the literature, about the essence, about the people and he started being able to make a difference between Spain and its history and its essence and its culture and the colonial government in Cuba. And he maintained that love for Spain and that hatred for the colonial system he was fighting. And so this was an important time in, in his youth. When they graduated, Fermin invited him to go to Paris where he probably met Victor Hugo and um, visited him at that home where Victor Hugo lived. Um, from there he goes to Mexico where his family has moved to. His father really never did very well in life. He had odd jobs and so forth, but his mother had inherited some money and that helped the family. Um, and um, when he went to Mexico, he learned of the death of his dear sister, Anna. And, um, and he also started uh, collaborating in magazines. He had a play that was staged um, uh, Amor con Amor se paga, and he translated Victor Hugo. Um, but um, while he was in Mexico, he took a short trip for a few months to Guatemala, uh, where he taught at a girls' school. He had to find all, all kinds of ways of making money, and uh, where he met Maria Garcia Granado and the story of La Niña de Guatemala, the famous poem he wrote following year after she died. Um, he returned to Mexico. He was engaged to Carmen Xaya Bassan, and they were married uh, at one of the cathedral's chapel in December 1877. Now, shortly after that, uh, the La Paz del San Juan was signed between the Mambises and the Spanish military. There's a picture of uh, General Martinez Campo entering triumphantly in uh, Havana. And Martin and his wife returned to live in Cuba in September 1878. Um, this is important that we remember this because now there are people who are returning to live in Cuba, <coughs> there are people who travel to Cuba, and there's all this discussion whether you should or you shouldn't, or do you help uh, by, you know, and, and that is not new. It happened in the 19th century. And, uh, and at that time, Martin did return to Cuba and live there for some time. Um, and during that time, his son Pepito uh, was born, and he describes it in one of his uh, uh, letters or one of his diaries as one of you know the happiest days of his life. And he, he dedicated a poetry book to him, Ismarillo, which is which really um, not only very tender and beautiful, but very revolutionary in its poetic style, very modernist. Um, one of the things that he did in Cuba is he was invited to a banquet in honor of Adolfo Martínez Telly, who was a well-known journalist, and uh, at um, El, El Hotel El Louvre, which is the smaller man, the one next to the Teatro Tacón. And, um, and that's where he coined a phrase that so many people um, say, honrar honra, when he was talking about Adolfo Martínez Telly. But something more important to me happened, which was that he criticized the, poli the politics or the policies of the Cubans inside Cuba, the autonomistas, who, who were trying to get Spain to do reforms. That's why I say that history repeats itself. But not only because of whether they had faith in those reforms or not, but because they felt that trying to get Cubans to claim the rights and to have conscience of the rights would help them no matter what the outcome was. And uh, when Martí disagreed, Rafael Montoro, who was a very bright man and the leader of the Autonomista movement, replied to him, each hour has its possibilities and politics is the art of adjusting to them. So again, we see many other things that we still see today. 
Uh, he was very active. He, he talked at the cemetery and eulogy for one of his poet friends. He pronounced uh, speeches at Liceo de Anabacoa, uh, at the Liceo de Regla, uh, and he, he was very active, uh, you know, had, as he had been before against the colonial regime. So, therefore, he was um, detained while he was having lunch one day and uh, again deported to Spain. Again, he did a short trip to, um, to Paris and he arrived in, uh, in New York on January 3rd, 1880, where he would live um, the rest of his life except for some short trips. Um, a few months later, in March 3rd, exactly two months later, his wife and his son joined him. He stayed, they stayed only for a few months. Um, it was a rocky marriage. Carmen did not approve of her husband's commitment to Cuba's independence. Not so much because she was pro-Spanish, but because she wanted a normal <laughs> husband that would have a 9 to 5 job, that would bring money to the house, and that he was always running around, going to meetings making speeches, uh, having odd jobs, and um, that kind of instability uh, didn't work well with marriage. And maybe there was something else. Um, this is the boarding house of Carmen Villares Mantilla, where Martí stayed when he first arrived to New York, in those two months before Carmen arrived. And um, this is Maria's, uh, Carmen's youngest daughter, Maria Mantilla, and who was born in November of that year. Many biographers believe she was the daughter of Martí, and some don't. Uh, there's been no DNA test, um, <laughs> so we don't know. But to me, I think that picture, she looks a lot like him, and he had a picture of her with, with him when he died, and one of the last letters he wrote was to her. So whether he was his daughter or not, he, certainly she was very close to him, and, and he loved her very dearly. Um, Personally, I do think it was his daughter, but until we have a DNA <laughs> test, we'll, we'll never know. Um, I took a short trip to Venezuela, um, and he narrates in um, La Edad de Oro how that beautiful passage seen um, uh, quitarse el polvo del camino ni preguntar dónde se come ni se bebe, el viajero fue a visitar la estatua de Ori. And, um, it's a very beautiful passage when he goes to, to visit Bolivar Stadio. He found it in a magazine. And again, because history repeats itself, the um, situation in Venezuela was such that Martí was uh, uh, expelled by the president of Venezuela himself. Um, so I think um, you know, things continue to happen. Now, um, we're going to focus a little bit on the exile, the immigrant, and I think a lot of the people in this um, audience would um, identify with this either themselves or their parents. I'm sure, told uh, or grandparents have told uh, some of the young people here these stories. My Marty had all kinds of jobs. He he taught Spanish, French, and oratory. He was a bookkeeper. Uh, he translated for Appleton and Company, and that's the building of Appleton and Company. He was a consul of Uruguay and represented Uruguay in many conferences and of some other Latin American countries for a shorter time. And he, he was a journalist. He, he published in Spanish for La Nación Buenos Aires and in English for The Hour and The Sun. When he died, there was a beautiful editorial by Charles Dan and The Sun about, about Martin. Um, as a journalist, uh, he wrote of many important events during his stay in New York such as the assassination of uh, President Garland and the inauguration of the Statue of Liberty. Uh, he also wrote about um, the inauguration of the Brooklyn Bridge. He wrote about Impressionist uh, art exhibits. He wrote about the snowstorm of 1888. And those North American scenes are translated. They are in English. They're easy to find. And they really not only tell you, I mean, he wrote about the democracy, the political process, uh, his view, but it also tells you a lot about life in the United States uh, at the end of the 19th century. It's just, it's, they're fascinating. Um, he did uh, portraits of different figures, I mean, among them uh, Ralph Waldo and Walt Whitman, which were his contemporaries. And in the middle of all that, he found time to edit a magazine for children. 
uh, many Cuban generations have grown up uh, memorizing some of its poems. And um, of course, sometimes he needed a break. We all do. Uh -huh. And he would like he liked to go to a, a, probably he had friends, and he he often went to a beach in Newport, Rhode Island. And he wrote that famous poem Rosa Patico de Rosa, which stars I saw Buena Mar de Puma, Arena Fina, and Pilar quiere estrenar su sombrerito de pluma. And um, for many years that I knew that that poem by heart, and I still kind of tear up when I read it. Um, I thought that Pilar was going to be next to me in the, in, in the beach in Havana, or Valero, and it was until I was really much, much older that I realized that that wasn't happening in Cuba, but in, when in Rhode Island. And uh, I'm sure that many Cuban children didn't discover that, or still haven't discovered that. Um, he also liked to go to the mountains, I guess, you know, New York was a busy city, and he took refuge in the Gaskill Mountains, and in the fall of 1890, he spent a few weeks there uh, preparing his book, Versos Sencillos. One of them is, Yo soy un hombre sincero, de donde crece la palma, y antes de morir me quiero echar mis versos del alma. Uh, much later, in the 20th century, the Cuban composer, Julian Orbón, put music to this poem, poems, and they were made famous by the sandpipers in La Guantanamera. Yeah. Martí did not write La Guantanamera, Martí wrote the verses that were musicalized by Julian Orbo. Um, he had an office, a small office, on 21st <coughs> Street, near Wall Street, and he, he was um, like uh, honey to bees. He attracted people, and whether he was an immigrant looking for a job, or a cigar maker on vacation, or somebody who needed a doctor, or would be a relative for a surgery, or young people wanted to publish a book, they all went to see him and crowded his, his little office in downtown Manhattan. Um, Marty, of course, also uh, was a, a human being. We tried to sometimes just think of the myth. And one of the things he, he liked uh, was the Del Monico restaurant on the Fifth Avenue and 29th Street, which is still there. There are many things, ways that you can follow Marti and go into the places where, where he was. And um, he liked to go to Little Italy for minestrone, and he liked to go to Little Hungary for goulash. And we also like you know that he liked to drink gin. Um, the page. In that office of 21st Street, he also housed the Partido Revolucionario Cubano and the Patria newspaper, which were the main vehicles for him to um, try to organize the War of Independence. Um, to, he made many speeches in different places in New York. In this, the Hartman Hall, which is the smaller one, um, Ruben Darío, um, he, he introduced Ruben Darío, the Nicaraguan poet, who talked to Spanish, to the Cubans. And um, they say he was, he was such an orator that people who didn't even understand what he was saying, would, he would bring them to tears because of the, the emotion and the, the, the beauty of the wisdom of, of, of his um, talk. The Cubans then, like now, were in the newspapers, and the Harper Weekly uh, really covered a lot of um, Sometimes with drawings, sometimes with photographs of um, all the things that Cubans did. Um, Martillo lived at some time, during some time at Brook in Brooklyn, and he would take the ferry from Manhattan to Brooklyn and back and forth to Brooklyn to Manhattan, and he would ride feverish um, aboard the ferry because, in addition to his poetry, to his speeches, um, to his journalism, he he maintained a extensive correspondence with with other Cubans and with other people too. And also he wrote letters to the editors. And he was very closely watched by the Spanish. They had a firm of detectives called Pinkerton and Company that were always um, uh, following him. Um, he traveled to many cities where there were communities of Cubans um, to try to have them contribute to the cause of, of Cuban independence. And here you see him in Ivor City, in Tampa, the cigar workers, and then surrounded by them. Uh, that place is still there. I've been 
there I've taken a photograph of myself or my piece to it, like I made a speech, <laughs> and uh, there's a bust of, uh, of him there. So as I say, there are many places you can really follow his, his itinerary and go to the places where he went. He also went often to Key West because there were cigar workers there. As Key West, like uh, how it looked when Marti went, and that's the Hotel Duval where he stayed, which still exists and Duval Street he has a plaque with his um, saying that he stayed there. He traveled to Jamaica where there were lots of Cubans too. You can see him there among the people and you can see one of his few full body photographs, um, a pretty well known photograph. He traveled to Costa Rica, he traveled to Panama too, he traveled to other places, I've just uh, selected a few because Antonio Maceo lived there. Antonio Maceo had, had, was a military. He had fought in the War of the Ten Years, as Maximo Gomez, and um, they don't always saw eye to eye, but he had the idea of founding a, a republic, uh, of, of, of having a civil mentality even in war. And um, Maceo was, um, you know, but he, all the time he, he tried to add people and, and multiply and uh, so he went to Costa Rica to, to meet with Maceo. Uh, he also went to Central Valley, convinced to Magistral Palma, <coughs> who was a teacher at that time, to join the Partido Revolucionario Cuba. Uh, Estrada Palma later became uh, Cuba's first president. Many historians, many people say that he was imposed by Americans, but the truth is that Estrada Palma had fought in the Ten Year War had been deported, had been imprisoned, and it was Martí who went looking for him, and when he left, Martí left New York, he put him in charge of El Partido Revolucionario. So rather than being picked by Americans, I think, Americans might be pleased because he knew the United States and he, and he had lived here for some time, but it was really Martí's selection of having him as his second man. Um, Maximo Gómez, who was from Dominican Republic and had fought in the Ten Year War, and Maceo often went to New York. They stayed at this hotel on West 9th Street, and uh, they made the plans for, for the war, and sometimes they, they clashed. They have different uh, views on, on how to wage war. They had a real setback in January um, 1895, they have been sending expeditions to Cuba with arms and ammunition, but at this time um, they were ready to send three ships to Cuba uh, from Fernandina, a port near Jacksonville, and they were confiscated by the American government. The American government, and, and I'm sure that you know this happened a lot to Cuban exiles in the 60s too. Uh, they claimed their law of neutrality. Uh, Spain had a field day and a lot of the plans that Cuba have, and a lot of the money that I had collected and spent uh, really was lost. So it was uh, a very difficult time for the Cuban revolutionaries. But Martí, he was a man of letters, he was a poet, an orator, an organizer, he was frail, he had had health problems, uh, he had no military training, uh, he was being criticized for sending all this to war and not leading by example. And so he decided he had to go, but also I think perhaps it was not only that criticism, there were others that didn't want him to go because they felt he was more needed in New York. But I think he also felt that, that Cuba needed a foundational myth and, and that he was ready to sacrifice for that. And so he decided to join the war. Uh, he was fully aware that he would not return to New York. Uh, right before leaving, he, he visited uh, some friends. It's narrated beautiful by Blanca Baral in a piece called El Martí que yo conocí. Martí, I knew it, this piece is translated too. In which she narrates that uh, Martí went to say goodbye to the family. She was a young woman at the time. And um, days later, they, they, they found uh, in the cat coat rack, a, a coat, and they didn't know whose it was. And they looked in their uh, pockets and they found some papers and they realized that Marti had, had left it there. And that was, in spite of the cold, it was a very cold night of January, he, he left his, his coat behind. Um, this is the house of the Miranda family, 
where Marty spent his last night in New York on January 31st, 1895, three days after his 42nd birthday. There's some discussion whether this house was on 57th Avenue or 64th Avenue, or, or but this is the house. I think it, my sources, I think it was on 57th. Um, he traveled to Santo Domingo, he travels to, to IT Haiti, and finally, a couple months later, he arrives in Monte Cristi, where Maximo Gomez lives, in that very modest little house where I have been. It's a really very small home. Um, and that's where they write and sign El Manifiesto de Monte Cristi, which is like Cuba's uh, uh, Bill of Rights, and Cuba's first uh, Carta Magna. Um, uh, on February 24th, 1895, the War of Independence begins with 35 uprisings, mainly in the Oriental provinces. And this was ordered or by Martí, the date was said, it was in coordination. Um, and a um, few months later, weeks later, on the night of April, 11, 1895, Martí, Maximo Gómez, and a group of Cuban volunteers landed in Palitas Oriente to join the War of Independence. Maximo Gómez was very fond of Martí. Um, they, they, <coughs> he, he treated him close with a lot of tenderness and love and tried to protect him, and um, there was no problem between them. Um, there's a the place, uh, the Boillo, where they asked to stay the first night, and Martí's diary, and I don't know if it's translated into English, I assume it probably is, it's beautiful to read. He has almost a childlike uh, emotion when he sees the Cuban countryside and, uh, and when he sees himself among his compatriots. And he realizes that they know him in Cuba and they call him Presidente. Mm -hmm. And this is a surprise to him because he's a man that had been working feverish but had no, you know, there were no emails then, there were no internet, no Facebook. He had no feedback about whether they knew him in Cuba or not. Um, and, and when he sees these simple guajitos that, that call, and the people in the troops calling him Presidente and, and being so loving to him, he, he's very touched. He adapts in spite of that he had no military training. Uh, I guess maybe in New York you walk a lot, well, but, but, you know, they had to walk a lot, and he has had problems um, because of the, um, that he had been hurt when he was in prison. Um, but he adapts, and, he's, and he, he, he has a joy um, in, in, during these months that he's in Cuba. Um, on May 5th, there's a meeting between Gomez and Maceo Martí which has been subject of controversy mainly because the pages of Marti's diary uh, were torn and have never been found. Most people think that it was Maximo Gomez who, who did that. And, um, but it's certain that they 